Welcome back, America. Two Hewitt. Good morning to you. Joined by Senator Ted Cruz of Texas. Good morning, Senator. How you doing? Hugh, good morning. Good to be with you. Now, I got a piece of advice for you. I have uh, I've been involved with Seth Rogen on Twitter before. That's really uh, not a situation you can win because he's an angry young man or older man. And it's not really about a conversation with Seth. Well, I've seen some of your back and forth with him, and I, I, I've noticed the only way he knows how to respond is, is screaming expletives, and it, it's a little bit like trying to reason with a child throwing a temper tantrum in a supermarket. Yeah, there's a little displaced anger. There's got to be something going on in Mr. Rogan's life, and so I just I don't think he can win that one, Senator. Let's get to, <laughs> to more serious. Honestly, if someone just throws uh, bananas at the wall, there's something going on there, and I just say to you, not really worth engaging someone who's off center um, on Twitter. Uh, Senator, you're a constitutional expert, Supreme Court clerk, all that good stuff. Argued dozen. How many times you argue in the Supreme Court? Eight times, nine times? Uh, nine times. Nine times. So my question about the impeachment proceeding is, does President Trump have standing in Florida to bring an injunctive action uh, seeking a remedial injunction to to stop the Senate the moment it begins to sit. So he might well have standing, but uh, but I don't think he would succeed in any legal action in a federal court. I, I don't think a, a federal judge would try to intrude uh, into the Senate and how it conducted an impeachment trial. And I think if he if he brought a case in federal court, they'd throw it out. No, I agree with Judge Ludig and Alan Dershowitz and your colleague Tom Cotton. This is an unconstitutional proceeding because he's a former official. Therefore, I think there might be a political question doctrine here uh, put aside, because if this goes forward, every former official, and I am one of them, having been confirmed by the Senate long, long ago in the Reagan years, we would be subject to impeachment by a vindictive Congress for anything. Isn't that the precedent? Well, I think there's a a, a serious argument to be made on that. Um, You know, my my view on this, I, I, I think this this impeachment is a mistake. I think it is petty and vindictive on the Democrats' part, and I think they're engaged in political retribution. And so I'm going to vote against conviction. I don't believe uh, President Trump is going to be convicted. I don't think there are going to be 67 votes to convict. Um, I actually think the question of whether an ex-president can be impeached is a close question. I, I think there are strong and serious constitutional arguments on both sides of the question. Uh, you mentioned Judge Ludig. As you know, I clerk for Judge Ludig. I know him exceptionally well, and, and Alan Dershowitz was a professor of mine in law school. Uh, both of them are, are, are scholars who I respect greatly. That being said, I think if you look to the constitutional text, there, there are strong arguments on both sides in terms of whether a, a, a so-called late impeachment can happen. And it turns out, as one looks at the issue, this is not a new issue. It, it has been debated, in fact, for centuries. And uh, the United States Congress has twice uh, gone forward in, with late impeachments, with, with impeaching uh, individuals after their term of office was, was over. And, and in fact, in Britain and then under British common law, uh, the British had done so three separate times. And, and so that I view the constitutional question as close. I don't view the merits as close. I, I, I think this serves no function other than political retribution, and I don't think the Senate ought to be wasting our time with this. Now, Judge Lydig has argued that, um, and by the way, I've read Lawrence Tribe, and I've read some of the other arguments that argue that uh, uh, after-office impeachments are appropriate. Uh, His argument is that political question doctrine would not apply because this is not committed to the Senate in terms of the trial on its face, as, for example, two-thirds of the Senate required to confirm a treaty. That's just something left to the Senate on the face of the of the Constitution. But that does not say anything on the face of the Constitution about former officials. And those precedents, Judge Lydig argues, are in opposite because they concerned, um, in one instance, the former Secretary of War and a number of your colleagues in the Senate of whatever it was, 1867, invoked jurisdiction to vote for acquittal. Do you expect a number of your senator colleagues to have invoked jurisdiction to vote for acquittal? You know, I don't know. On the political question doctrine, what I think would be compelling is, is the text of the Constitution, Article 1, says the House has, quote, the sole power of impeachment. Uh, and it also says the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. And, and I think 
most federal judges, when reading a constitutional provision that says the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments, I, I think a federal judge would say, well, if the Senate has the sole power, I'm not sticking my nose in the middle of it. And and so I think that uh, I, I, I think a judicial remedy here is is exceedingly unlikely. So my um, next question is procedural. Uh, you yeah. and I disagree on that because it goes on to say sole remedy of impeachment of president, vice president and other officials. And he's not an official. So we disagree on that. But if he brings a ma- if he brings an action in the district court of Florida and then the 11th Circuit and then the Supreme Court, if he's dismissed, into, does the Senate have to stop and pause pending the disposition of that judicial action? Um. One could certainly make an argument the Senate should. I don't think there's any chance Chuck Schumer will do so voluntarily, which would mean it would take a judicial order uh, to possibly change that. And I think that's, uh, as I mentioned, quite unlikely. Uh, look, I think this is this is a foolhardy endeavor. You know, Joe Biden last week at his inauguration gave this impassioned plea for unity. And congressional Democrats, their first response is, great, let's spend the first month of the Biden administration impeaching Donald Trump. They just hate Trump. And, and it's for them, their partisan hatred is a higher priority than actually working for the people of this country, than doing something about the global pandemic we face, than, than, than helping the tens of millions of people out of work actually get back to work and helping businesses reopen. And, and I just think it's, it's a case of misplaced priorities. Uh, but that being said, Chuck Schumer and the angry partisans are driving the train, and I don't think they're going to voluntarily uh, stop. So, Senator, when those article, the article was transmitted yesterday, the Senate departed from its prior precedent of immediately moving into impeachment. When they do begin the trial, pursuant to the agreement between the Republicans and the Democrats in a couple of weeks, is it your understanding you will do nothing but the impeachment until it is acted on? Uh, I assume that is the case, but but I will confess I don't know the details uh, of everything that has been agreed to. So the way this is proceeding is, has been agreed to between Mitch McConnell uh, and Chuck Schumer, and, and my understanding is that they've agreed to the timing of the pretrial briefing, but I don't, I have not seen any agreement as to the specific time constraints of the trial and how it will uh, occur. We obviously did an impeachment trial a year ago, and that one, once the trial began, uh, there, there was a limit on time. Each side had 24 hours. There was a questioning period, and 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 then then we concluded. Um, I have not seen an agreement on the specific uh, conduct of the trial. I assume there will be something. I hope it will be substantially more expedited than the last one. But, but I don't know what the Democrats. I mean, this is this is not an exercise uh, of reason or logic or principle. This is an exercise of anger and rage. And well, and- I agree with that. But as a, you know, I got to teach my con law kids pretty soon. I got to explain to them there was no due process in the House. There was no collection yeah. of evidence. Agreed. And and therefore you've got uh, what a hundred thousand people on the mall, eight hundred of whom are insurrectionists who entered into the into the Congress. And a lot of the evidence you would need to take are people who heard the president. And I mean, you might get two witnesses from every state and have a, a good sampling. But is there going to be any evidentiary, uh, even pretense here? Because without evidence, it is completely outside of the norms of American judicial proceedings. So I have no idea. Uh, I have not seen the Democrats focused on actually taking evidence. And I don't know how the Trump uh, legal defense team is going to handle it. Uh, I expect most of the arguments are going to be legal arguments rather than purely factual. Um, and for the Democrats, at least, facts don't matter. Remember, these are the same Democrats who were talking about impeaching President Trump in 2017 when he was just elected. It, it, it's not connected to conduct any more than, la- than last year's impeachment was connected to conduct concerning Ukraine. Uh, it wasn't driven by the facts. It's driven by hatred. And, and, and this is – they now have – have power. And, and, and where the Democrats are right now, it reminds me of the end of every Godfather movie. At the end of every Godfather movie, Michael Corleone, he settles his debts and they eliminate all their enemies. That, that's where the Democrats are right now. They're trying 
They're trying to destroy Donald Trump because they hate him. They're trying to destroy every conservative they can. And, and it is it, it's the antithesis of the unity that Joe Biden rightly called for. And, and I don't think it's going to be successful. They're going to have their rage, and then the Senate's going to reject the impeachment, and then hopefully we'll move on from there. Senator, uh, last question. In Korematsu, uh, Senator, uh, Justice Jackson, who is among my favorite justices, yeah. dissented, and he said the majority opinion was like a loaded weapon left lying around on a table. I believe an impeachment of a former official is such a precedent. Does that persuade you at all? Do you think it will persuade any Democrat that we really do not want this precedent of impeaching former officials lying around? So I don't think it will persuade a single Democrat. I I think the Democrats will all vote to convict. I think they all hate Donald Trump. And I don't think the merits, I don't think law, I don't think the Constitution is is a factor in their consideration. Uh, Among Republicans, I think Republicans will probably be split on the question of jurisdiction. To be honest, many of the Republicans who are concluding there's no jurisdiction, that they're doing it because that's an easier ground to do it than than going to the merits. And that's fine. I I think you're going to end up with virtually all of the Republicans voting against impeachment. You may have a couple of Republicans join the Democrats, but we're not going to get to 67. It's not going to end in conviction. And and my view, look, like, like you, Hugh, I'm a longtime litigator. My view is get to the to, to the final final result. In this case, rejecting conviction. That's where we're going to end up. And if different senators want to have different bases to get there, that's that's fine by me. And in the meantime, this does not advance any sort of phase five of COVID relief. Correct? It blocks it. Uh, it, it blocks it. It blocks confirmations. It, it blocks everything. But you know, this is. <sighs> They're, you know, it, it, the Democrats are going to do a lot of damage to the country over the next two years. And and in particular, the fact that they won the two Georgia Senate seats and took control of the Senate is unbelievably consequential. Um, I can tell you in the Senate, I'm going to be leading the fight at every stage to stop the bad and harmful policies they're trying to pass that that, that, that are trying to force uh force this country down the road to socialism and i'm going to be leading the fight but this is going to be a difficult two years here's the good news i think the democrats are going to overreach i think they're going to going to go too far and too extreme and i think as a consequence we're going to see the pendulum swing back i think 2022 is going to be a very good election i think 2024 is going to be a very good election because they're extreme radical dangerous policies they don't work and they're going to go too far Senator Ted Cruz, always good to talk with you. Keep coming back, Senator, and stay off Twitter with crazy people. Good to to speak with you. Take care. Take care. 